Okay, so we've moved into the Arrow 3D Auditorium, uh, effectively a cinema, with uh, an amazing uh, speaker array system in here. And I've just been listening to some uh, film clips and some con uh, film content in uh, Aura 3D and uh, have, having moved from the music uh, studio where I was blown away um, I'm not sure how I can be blown away more than once but let's suffice it to say that I've been blown away more than once. Uh, so we're sat here in the auditorium and I'm joined by Gareth and Sven uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Aura system in the cinema. So we're in effectively a very nice cinema but in essence a, a, a cinema so how does the speaker system differ to the experience that I had in the uh, the Neve uh, control room? Yeah so we're looking at a bigger space clearly so the first thing that's different is there's um, for all of the work we do in here in the height channel we have a height center speaker which isn't always the case in music you're in a smaller environment and that sort of space doesn't need to be filled, but that's very important for, for film work. Um, as we all know, there'll be phantom, phantom imaging doesn't really work. Uh, in a bigger space. In a bigger space, you know, at least not across the whole sort of front of the cinema. Um, the surrounds as well, we're looking at a, a larger array of speakers rather than the ITE setup, which is coming virtually from a single point. Um, and that's um, reflected, we have effectively a 5.1 along the bottom, it can be 7.1. Um, and then we have a complementary, should we say, um, layer up above that. And they're sort of, they're placed above each other all around the theater, which gives you a kind of a, a kind of a stereo image effectively um, with height. And we've got a top channel, which is mono. Um, and you've heard with some of the uh, demos at that. Yeah, the Again, that's flyovers, sort of, the, yeah. mo the most important stuff really is this sort of, um, this angle, this height, this second layer, mm. but in a large space, that sort of that will fill um, the gap and will give you really that flyover experience. Because I mean, it was very interesting in some of the uh, demonstration examples where you have th this sort of town centre square uh, audio recording and listening to the whole audio and then just the lower layer yeah. and then the higher layer by itself and what was very interesting with that example is that when we just had the lower layer it was very flat very 2d but when we had just the high layer there seemed to be some more two and a half d shall we say there seemed to be some uh, some more it, level more spread to it and then obviously the whole system all together uh, and then the the second example where we were you know in a country uh, road and the birds definitely came from the sky from up above but of course they were only effectively we weren't using the the ceiling channel the voice of god channel for that. that was just the the higher the top layer the height layer but it definitely felt very much enveloped that you know without the the ceiling uh, channel which was very very interesting and then the tractor passing again as i experienced with the um the music the, it was this total envelopment this immersive sound and it felt so much more realistic uh, because of course i'm hearing all the early reflections of the tractor passing from the trees and the road and all of those early reflections which have got lots of height information in them we're getting reflection from higher up which of course in a normal 5.1 or 7.1 setup we don't get but of course in this 3d the aura 3d we do get and that was that was very very interesting So with those sorts of uh, elements and that degree of, uh, of spread, how do you, do you approach the film mixing process differently because you've got these different layers to play with? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something I've thought about a lot over the the previous years of sort of experimenting with this format and, and starting to use it um, for for real work. And it's it's um, it's new, but it's also there's a lot of familiarity. I think the the fact that we've got another sort of 5.1 we're all very used to or certainly film guys are very used to doing a working in a 5.1 environment and we sort of we've extended that above and um a lot of the techniques you would use to sort of go from stereo to surround are kind of still effective and a lot of the approaches you take we discussed earlier about you know whether you have a a native uh, recording for those speakers or whether you combine that with with track layer effectively to, yeah, to layer up those layers. That demonstration recording was a native yes. recording. It was in a mic yep. array, which was a single array designed to pick up the height, the yep. height layer and the, the normal layer all in one go. Um, but it's not always the best thing to do for cinema because of yep. the storytelling, is yep. it? it just Having a sort of a native recording is fantastic, um, but we know from normal film mixing which we say your 5.1 traditional 7.1 that those um those kind of native recordings have have their use um but they're not u universally used all of the time because we're telling a story and we're trying to control elements and we're trying to give um and there's action happening and we have to sort of serve the story so having a you'll often find there's sort of beds of 5.1 or beds of 7.1 and they've layered up the, the the elements around it and it's a similar thing with with storytelling um with with 11.1 or with the with the Oro format is that you have to look at what the best approach is. There's the practicality, of course, of having native recordings, which you can utilize, because obviously a lot of the action is added afterwards. We've looked at some clips with a lot of VFX, so that native recordings won't exist for those things. So you have to use other methods, you know, panning and, and creating reflections for those things to give them the spatial um, positioning. Um, but it's fantastic if you can combine, if you can combine the two, and if you if you know what's coming up, you can sort of you can plan those recordings. And certainly, if you're in an environment which is particularly interesting for height, you can maybe do some recordings there. Um, but you know, you you need to combine the two approaches. It'd be lovely if we could say everything would be native recordings, like you possibly have the option to do in in music, because everything's pretty static. Once they've sat down there playing, they're going to stay there. That's a luxury we don't often have, but you can bring that in with the music. Certainly, the music fully can be native recordings, and that's kind of a, a no-brainer in the sense that you just need to record those elements when you're doing it. Add those extra mics. I'm sure Patrick will have explained some of that, and that's that's easy, you know, to do. You were talking earlier about a, a recording where you went out to try to get some native recordings uh, on, uh, on a boat, yep. and it didn't quite work. What was the issue with Well, this that? is, yeah, this is part, I mean, the whole sort of, uh, we, we've gone from the start trying to figure out everything from, from the ground upwards. And one of the early things we had was, and this is, this is quite early on, we had a film with, a, with, uh, with some scenes on a, out on the water, monster movie. And we had to kind of, we had to, we thought, you know, Wilfred was, Wilfred was all over it. Great, we're going to go and send a guy out and do some recordings. And he did some fantastic recordings, and all of the sort of the, the land-based ones were brilliant, really useful. And we could sort of we could place those in. And when you're doing when we were doing the original mix, you could just sort of conflate them into a five-one, and then you know later when we needed them, they would be they would be eleven-one. But yeah, the 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 the, the recordings at at sea, of course, you expect to have in your when you imagine that sort of scene water along the, along the bottom and all the the air and the wispy wind and the the seagulls and birds above you and of course if you go out and record on a boat you're going to record water here and then the top microphones are going to get water as well waves so we had splashing around the top so we had to sort of rethink that and you know it's so effectively almost re layer that up yeah because there are times when reality yeah reality isn't um uh it doesn't do the right thing or isn't sort of, you know, conversely, is less believable than, um, or less sort of e emotive than actually creatively layering those things up, yeah. So and presumably using s steered sound effects um, can also help the narrative because you can direct yeah. the audience to a particular sound, particular part of the story by being able to direct it. So again, presumably that's another place where the native sounds 
perhaps aren't as effective as yeah absolutely um, because you know uh, it'd be very very difficult to try and replicate um, movement say that tractor was in a was in a was in a film it'd be very difficult to replicate that so um, they have their place and if you can you know I think the obvious the obvious one is sort of your ambience recordings and your music recordings that's pretty straightforward and that can have a spectacular immersive feel but yeah you're going to have to look at um because a lot of the sounds won't really exist in the real world anyway you know you look at um big monster movie or a robot movie those sounds don't exist and they're going to have to be sort of panned through but there's a lot you can do to give it spatial even with you know mono or stereo source tracks you can move around with the aura system there's a lot you can do with reflections and things to give to accentuate that space and really make it believable um, you know rather than just panning it's you can mm. you can add that layer as well which I think is useful and part of the uh, one of the examples we th there was we've got the flyovers and I was a little obviously having come from the music where we've got a distinct effectively ITU equivalent monitoring yeah. system so everything is going to be very stable um, and I was a little concerned with things like the flyovers whether because we've got distributed surround channels mm -hmm. whether that would be convincing um, and I have to say big tick it, yeah. they were incredibly convincing because those flyovers are, have always been a challenge that sort of sense that you almost want to duck your head as whatever it is a helicopter a plane goes over Certainly for me, this is probably the first time where I've, I've been, again, it's like the music. I was in the concert hall here. I was convinced that we had the helicopter. Now, yeah. obviously helped by having a superb uh, quality speaker uh, playback system here, which has got a, a you know, really low end, you know, everything yeah, nice. plays really well. But again, that, 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 that flyover uh, just worked. It, you, you forget that you're in an auditorium, yeah. which I suppose is... Yeah, having, having more microphones to capture su such a flyover gives more information for us to, to, to basically process. So, um, and that's probably the reason why it works, because the, the, the brain gets more information right where the microphone is in a... Uh, the, the, the plane is at a certain moment in time, so... Um, and all that distances are translated in the recording, and so the reproduction is, is much more natural than... You could check as well because you listen very much here, but the experience is really, and it's it's it really surprised me actually. It's really uh, rep replicable around the th around the room. You don't have that. You don't feel like it's steering because you have sort of reflections coming f from different spaces as a whole. They sort of meet your, you know, when mm. wherever you are, they kind of meet you at the right with with, with good enough timing that the, the experience is very similar around the room. I mean, again, going back to the music example, yeah. You know, not there's only one or two people in the concert hall in the magic well in stereo where we call the sweet spot yeah of course it, in an auditorium music auditorium there are people everywhere and it's still very believable and again it was very interesting patrick said because he was he was he was sat at pro tools off center and he still found it very believable so yeah. again the, in the uh, and that's obviously critical in yeah. a in a theater situation yeah. a cinema situation where there are only about two seats which are in the magic sweet spot. It's got to translate to people sitting nearly over to one side, people near the back. Um, this is, I mean, this is also one of the reasons we've all been in that situation. If you work, you know, if you mix for film, you think, oh, that sounds, you know, the whole idea when people were kind of figuring it out in the first place, they'd maybe put things stereo and imagine that that phantom image would work. And of course, you have a big shock when you sit around the front. And I think your best bet is always um, having a coherent field which you create and you know there are things like the center channel for dialogue and things which they're there for a reason you know that people stick to that and don't really go out of it that much in a film unless there's really good reason and i think creating like a field um of sound is the best way of getting an immers immersive experience um and, and the same with the heights yeah know. the action is always on the screen you know mm -hmm. i mean to, to follow yeah. the story that you need to, to the you need to keep the focus on the screen with the story, otherwise it gets distracted and then you, you, you shut off and then you don't follow the story anymore and that's, that's the least. Well, mm -hmm. that's definitely not what the storyteller wants, the filmmakers, right? So that's why we also 
kept um, the idea of, of having the arrays in the surrounds and also for the top channel, which is effectively a mono channel distributed over more than one speaker to give um, the, the largest amount in the auditorium um, the, the same experience, basically. Talking of the, the height channel, w creatively, are there opportunities to use the height channel? All the time. Absolutely. <laughs> There's always, you know, whenever I've I've, I've been involved from, from from doing a lot of the early mixes and there's always that sort of, um, you have to find a balance between novelty and, and taste and it depends what you're doing. But there's a lot of opportunities to put voices in there. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's things you haven't heard. Flyovers are an obvious thing, but we had um, a, a kind of a, a like a godlike narrator in one thing we did and it was, you know, it's perfect. Voice, voice of God. God. I mean, yes. and it was it was perfect for that. Um, but you know, but yeah. it was that was that a voice of God? Was that an, a, a straight narration, an off-screen narration, which of course we would normally put, yeah, you know, in the centre, or maybe a bit of uh, a bit of divergence? But in essence, it's going to, yeah. It's, again, it, it, for me in radio, that how we deal with that narration has always been a, a bit of a challenge. It, de it depends. Anything, anything coming, anything that we have. I mean, you know, it's surprising how disconcerting it can be to have dialogue off oh, off the centre channel. Yes. And it, it and going left and right almost feels really odd unless you know um, it, there's really good reason that like they're walking off you know, but to put stuff in the height we had a, I did a film and it was kind of um, it was a guy talking about his memory of the past so it it was sort of um, set in the war and he would kind of narrate as an old man and that worked perfectly just putting it up there yeah. and it was almost better than having it off on on centre channel because. It's almost, you know, the division between the two worlds that we're looking back at the historical part and he's speaking mm. in, in the present day. Mm. And that kind of thing works really, really well. You know, and, and context and taste are always the deciding factors ultimately and how crazy people want to go with throwing their effects around. But there's a lot of creative, cho you know, things you can do with it. And, you know, flyovers are an obvious thing, but also just placing, that's part of your sort of sound structure that things can go up there and it can be um, very useful to have that. So uh, you touched on it earlier. Essentially, once Wilfred had sort of dis come up with this concept of of, of the two layers, yeah. and then the experimentation about how high they should be, the angles, this thirty degree angle. Presumably, uh, that you've had to write the book on just about anything and everything to do with immersive sound. Because this is, you know, yeah, there is no, there is no guidebook. It's yeah. I mean, it's been thrilling and hard, you know, because you, you have to sort of, um, you have to push things and you have to try things, and things won't always be right. And you know, at the end of the day, especially when you're with film, um, there's, you know, you have to respect the fact that in a way you don't want to draw attention to what you're doing. Um, so. The balance is always there between the two, but yeah, in terms of um, experimentation, we've kind of gone through all of these things, speaker heights. In a, uh, Wilfred spent a lot of time with, you know, with building sort of uh, scaffolding that could put things at different heights and listening. And that I think is one of the greatest strengths of the system is that that speaker setup gives you great coherence and gives you realistic immersion. And I think that's pretty important. And that comes off the back of a lot of um, thinking about it and a lot of experimentation that's been done at the studios, yeah. Yeah, and, and presumably, again, as, as, a, as a mixer, as a dubbing mixer, you've had to, again, develop a set of techniques to work, so yeah. to move on from your 5.1 yeah. techniques, presumably you've had to develop a set of techniques. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as, as we move forward, I mean, more and more really exciting tools come out, so we've, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about um, some of the reverbs that are available that none of that stuff existed at sort of day one so um a lot of thing a lot of work for me was gone into sort of experimenting with what could what you can kind of get away with with reverbs you know layering up five ones perhaps taking impulse responses and and, and adding those together and sort of trying to make something work to create those reflections and also just finding out what works in terms of track lay what works going in that height layer because you obviously the main thing really is you want Sort of, you want it's a combination of coherence between the two layers and contrast. So it's like a balance of those elements, and 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 that's something you can only do through working with it and sort of trying it out. Because one of the first things you try and do is go, okay, I'll pan up and down, 
and that's nothing like you know our ears are sort of you know horizontal yeah. so already, presumably that only really it, works right. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it works i mean it, it, but our, we, there is um our brains get a lot of that through the timing difference yeah. um you almost need to exaggerate a bit that um that height difference so a lot of times you would sort of you'd pan things sort of straight up and think oh that's not enough and then you look at maybe sort of adding some high frequencies to sort of um, to localize better. So maybe that's instead of volume, you kind of change the, the frequency content. And there's all of these sort of things which you kind of learn through experience and, you know. And presumably when you're looking at beds, uh, again, going back to our sort of country uh, lane, would it be, for instance, as, as simplistic as to l put the the bird heavy atmos only in the, in the height layer? Yeah and perhaps put a more general uh, bird free or minimal bird uh, atmos track in the in the, the normal layer is that is yeah, it effectively, yeah is that? effectively yeah i mean you're looking at um what sort of works i mean how, you, you sort of start to think about when you start thinking about those layers you start to um uh, yeah, there's a natural kind of tendency to imagine the stuff above is airy and you know high and has that sort of high frequency content and things lower down maybe have more weight I mean I don't know if that's I think that's a natural tendency and you start to maybe track low with that in mind obviously with a caveat that if there's something big happening mm. up above it's gonna all change but yeah. um, I think most sound designers most tra most effects editors are very used to already thinking in terms of a you know 5.1 plane and a lot of their libraries are stereo, and they're sort of, um, they may have some beds that are five or seven one, but they're, they're sort of layering up things. And they're obviously, there's possibly more action on screen than there is in the back. Mm. And, uh, um, and it's a similar, you know, it's a similar thing. You have to look, but I think most people, when they get their hands on the system, they have a natural feeling for it, and it, it, it starts to become quite clear. But it is, yeah, a case of layering up those right sounds, which kind of, which kind of work. Um, coming back to dialogue, because obviously we've got the, the conventional left, center, right in the lower layer, and we've also got the, the left, center, right in the higher layer. Are you tending to effectively diverge the dialogue into both low, uh, normal, and, and high, or are you, or is there more at play with the dialogue? Um, no, I tend not to do that. I think there's. Um, I'm always conscious of fold down later. I'm always conscious of doing all the legacy formats and. Um, you can run in divergence generally you can sort of run into trouble you can certainly do it and certainly when characters are bigger you know if there's a reason to do it you can do it you have to check always what that's happening so you would happening. normally leave the dialogue in the conventional front well the it's, center really yeah but often if you know if you've got um you don't want it to be bouncing around too much so if it's a normal conversation they cut and and, and you know it tends to stay but there's definitely a lot of times when you put it in the top speaker especially with some of these big action movies when you've got a very large sort of creature or, or monster and it's coming up the top then its voice comes from up the top sure. um, and that's a pretty cool effect I wouldn't um, but it, it's like all these things there has to be good reason for dialogue to, to leave that center channel because it can be quite disconcerting if it moves but it's certainly less disconcerting moving it up um, than kind of going left and right yeah and uh, presumably again that's because of Hearing wise, yeah. you know, it's, it comes back to the tipping your exactly. head on the yeah. side to to to, yeah. to to localize the sound between the two. You'd layers. have to. It, it, it doesn't feel gimmicky at all. You feel it's more like you're sensing that there is something different, than something is more coming from above, literally, than than the other elements you have in the in the, in the lower layers. But it it doesn't feel like this is an effect or something that's happening. It's really, um, I quite like that. Yeah. On the one movie we, we did uh, with these crazy robots, it, it worked quite nice without like, without having the sense that something is falling apart on the screen. Um, it still sticks together, but it gives you that sense of like um, elevation, really. Because I mean that center channel is still like a real anchor point for mm -hmm. the main. I mean that's when you can guarantee, hopefully guarantee it's going to work in a yeah. cinema, you know, for a start. But also the, you know, everyone's going to have a similar experience for that, and it's. It is enjoyable and useful to have the option of going straight up, having the same effect in, in, in the sense of um, audience, uh, you know, their, their listening position. But having, you know, a separation is, you know, it's very cool. We talked um, earlier about a foreign language version. It's one of the territories where they just have a narrator. They don't have voice actors like they would have in, in German. It's not dubbed so much as they turn the volume down and someone speaks over it. Um, 
which is pretty, you know, to, 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 to my ear is always a bit shocking. But um, to separate the two is you can have that top speaker as your sort of local language voice in the bottom one still playing back the, the original mm. language source, which is really new for anyone that's had that kind of listening experience. That's, that's mm. a new thing. It's, yeah. You know. what, particularly with the screen channels, with the six of them, which we have, most mixers really like the um, idea that you can keep your mix more transparent. So, I mean, with the, the big action movies, there's so much going on in, in the three screen channels and it, it easily gets overcrowded. You have effects and you have music and you have dialogue and everything. And being able to split that to literally take load from individual speakers and basically push it to other speakers while still being on screen um, makes a big difference, really. Sonically, that you get a more transparent mix that you feel there is more air and you don't necessarily have to go that loud and compressed like you would do maybe in the 5.12 in order to get to push all the elements through there you have the clarity and you can still um get the same sense of like in, in intense um movie making i think like like we discussed that's always um i i'm always you have to strike a balance with with all of these sort of formats which allow you to kind of pull sounds a little bit off is that they're going to have to also be available in in in, in the other formats i think um but what's not you have to sort of if you're making those sort of decisions you still have to you, you go and monitor briefly if you're doing that and check it's working so on back the down checking your down right. mix what checking it, so your backwards compatibility. yeah absolutely but effectively what you can do then is have you can be happy with that down mix version um but then you know you've got that extra you know your your sort of high 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 fidelity version has that extra clarity and you hear you know there's you'd better you can hear the harmonics better so it kind of just gives you that you know extra little um yeah, yeah it's just that's, better yeah <laughs> that's actually a couple uh, well some of the comments we get is that when you compare the 5.1 to the 11.1 is that the 5.1 really feels a bit compressed although there's no compression going on it's still it's just is that a function of the of the fold down even if you do like a, a straight fold down on a desk with applying unity gain it still feels that there is like there is this this tension going on in the speaker really with the loud scenes at least that you feel this is not happening in oro if if you have the if you have more speakers it it just feels feels better i think a lot comes a lot of it comes down to density as well yeah. you know the further the further down sort of narrow formats you get you you kind of have to adjust you know pull things back a bit but um you can basically have the same mix um, and you can be very happy with your 5.1, but if you can hear that, you know, effectively sound pressure level and everything is effectively the same, but because it's separated out, it's coming from these different angles, and presumably those angles make sense, um, then, yeah, that's a very, very nice and sort of relaxing, um, if you can say yeah. that with some of these loud films, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But it's you know, true. the experience. Yeah, it's really, yeah, um, it's really true. So, presumably, you are, you know, as we do in in broadcast audio where we're starting to work in 5.1 we've still got to make sure that the fold down to stereo and to mono yep. works and that, w that the mix we produce for the small screen will fold, will fold down and so however the consumer is consuming it that is going to work so presumably with 11.1, 13.1 yep. you're having to make the same judgments? Absolutely yeah I think um, you sort of you ignore that at your peril in any of these formats, um, and um, you, you know there are there are ways of working that allow you to sort of m you know monitor all of your down mix paths. And yeah, I think you have to um, you have to take that into consideration. I think we've already, f from from my money, we've kind of learnt those lessons going from stereo to sort of up to five one. I think we all kind of understand to some extent what we can get away with and what in terms of you know re you know combining reverbs and avoiding phase and all of those and avoiding just build up of you know uh, of of conflicting sounds um a lot of those lessons have been learned you know, and they apply you know they apply for this format it's very um it makes logical kind of fold down sense so i think it's we're certainly not learning from from scratch um there's all of that knowledge is already mm. there and you're just applying it to the next yeah, stage. Yeah, taking that stereo to 5.1 jump and just... Exactly. It's, it's really it. not 
that dissimilar you have to sort of um and you, after a while you kind of know you know we like people are doing 5-1 mixes they're not continually checking their stereo the whole time unless they're really doing something a bit like um crazy mm. so, and because by by this point people know that their choices are kind of safe effectively and it's a similar sort of thing after a while you kind of know what you can get away with there are times you know you want to ch check you know if you're yeah. using um a ton of I don't know a special effect you 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 know you'll want to check that but um, as you gain experience you don't really need to do that and so we still have some level of of control over the 5.1 down mix so the 5.1 the Oro 5.1 encoded version can still be controlled to some extent so we can change the so levels you can between change the layers the, 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 the down mix right. matrix effect yeah exactly so uh, that's that moves me on because the next thing I was going to look at was Okay, so we've deli we've mixed this great 13.1, 11.1 mix in in a dubbing theatre like this, but the gr but my understanding is that the 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 13.1 or 11.1 can you effectively mix that and that how does that get to the cinema? Because do you not have the sort of down mixing done at the theatre end? How no, how does, how does the, the system get delivered? Yeah, once once we we finalised our mix in R eleven point one, which is still the, the, the most common format, um, we do one more path, and that path is creating the five point one out of the eleven point one mix. So as I just said, we have control over how we fold down the height layer into the lower layer and how we fold down the top channel into the lower layer, for instance. So we so can in change the, delivery, the levels. So in the delivery file, there is an 11.1 stream and a 5.1 down mix stream, which you've we, managed. We, right. We, we encode the 11.1 channels into a 5.1 carrier. So we carry the Oro mix in a regular 5.1 PCM and we store metadata which allows us to go back from the 5.1 into the full 11.1 in the theater. So the, the advantages of this like single file or single inventory um, distribution format that we can play back the 5.1 in all the 5.1 theaters. And in the Oro theater, we take the same DCP and decode the 5.1 through the Oro decoder to the full 11.1. And with a hundred percent channel separation, and it's it's virtually lossless. Yeah, so it, it's it's a it's a proper version of the old Dolby uh, LCRS, which was an analog matrix which didn't come back out. Properly. Right, the, the it, idea you, is the same. The technical yeah. realization is completely different because we use a mathematical uh, codec to do it. So there's no acoustical matrixing or something involved. Sure. But yeah, true. But it essentially means that that you can take that 5.1 encoded and play that right. without having to decode it exactly. but if you then put that f that 5 that equiv that LTRT equivalent um, into your decoder then you can get back the 111 exactly but crucially again different is you've got that full channel separation exactly exactly and in the in the cinema um, it's it's very important um, it was important for us from the, from the beginning to, to be DCI compliant, meaning that we can guarantee that everything we are playing back is being watermarked. So the actual decoding is happening in the media block um, of the DCP server or of the projector. So but it's just a detail, but um, it's kind of made things a little bit more complicated, but we were able to figure that out. So, But again, that's presumably all to... to piracy prevention right exactly processing. exactly watermarking is a, is a big subject in, in digital cinema to to protect the content from being pirated and we again are able to like we do with the 5.1 that the 5.1 gets played back watermarked and then through the b chain um reproduced we, we do essentially the same so we play back the 5.1 decode it to 11.1 watermark it and then go out to the speakers wow well, I have to say, uh, I wish my jaw could drop even further than it already <laughs> has done today with the, with the experiences. So thank you both very much for taking the time to share with us um, how you're using this, uh, this new format. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure.